Well, thank you, brothers Benjamin and Smith and Hutchins for leading us in worship tonight. We appreciate it very, very much. February is uh, uh, officially known in our country and by our government as Black History Month. President Gerald W. Ford said this uh, back in 1976. He said, I urge every American to seize the opportunity to honor the too often neglected accomplishments of black Americans in every area of endeavor throughout our history. Well, that's just, uh, that was not something that was new to uh, that day and time. Um, it started out as Black History Week back in uh, the early 1900s and was expanded from there and our government embraced it. And I'm glad that they did so. Normally, uh, somewhere around the, um, uh, the birthday of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., um, either I or Eric or both of us will uh, have something to say about uh, Dr. King and about the holiday and about how important for us to use that day to go out and do something good and service to others. I've even, um, from this pulpit, reworked some of uh, Dr. King's sermons and delivered them from this pulpit, and they've been well-received, and I appreciate that. But the, uh, the Civil Rights Movement did not begin with Dr. King. I mean, there were a lot of people who made tremendous contributions to the Civil Rights Movement in America. Uh, one of them was a gospel preacher by the name of Marshall Keeble. And um, uh, Brother Keeble was a man who... Uh, was a hero to many, many people, both white and black. As a matter of fact, white people in particular embraced him and financed his work because he became a great and powerful evangelist. An evangelist so effective that uh, the record books show uh, that he was responsible for 40,000 baptisms. He lived to be 90 years old. He... Um, was born in uh, 19 or rather 1878 and lived to uh, 1968. Um, he, um, there, there's a person in our audience tonight. We're moving to the next slide, uh, Brad, uh, who actually heard him preach. Uh, Jenny, uh, uh, Jimmy Crittenden back in um, 1950 when she was just a tiny little girl, <laughs> uh, heard him speak in, uh, in a tent meeting uh, in Hartsville, Hartsville, Tennessee, 50 miles east of Nashville. And she said he was so famous that she was so thrilled to be able to be in the audience where such a great and famous gospel preacher was present and where he was speaking. I recently read a, a thesis by... Um, by uh, Daryl Broking, uh, that was uh, a part of his uh, 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 graduate work at the East Tennessee State University, and he, he he titled it this: "Marshall Keeble and the Implementation of a Grand Strategy: Erasing the Color Lines in the Church of Christ." And I recommend this to you, and you can get it. It's on the internet. And by the way, there's so much stuff on the internet about Marshall Keeble. Um, there are stories and there are all kinds of things. And, of course, YouTube uh, sermons and things like that. And so I would encourage you to, to really learn all you can about the life and times of Marshall Keeble. Well, he, um, <clears throat> he had to drop out of school when he was in the seventh grade. But bear in mind that getting to the seventh grade in his day and time for white or black was a big deal. I mean, because most people didn't get that far. Uh, but uh, his family, he was born in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, and his family uh, moved to Nashville. And outside of Nashville, they bought a little farm, and they had a mortgage on it. And so it fell to him to drop out of school in order to get a job uh, to, uh, to help pay on the mortgage. He would work uh, like 60 hours a week. And he met a young lady by the name of Minnie who uh, had, uh, was better educated than him. She, her name was Winnie uh, Minnie Womack. And uh, uh, they got married, uh, it appears to be 18 or 19 years old. And uh, they, start, they became storekeepers. And um, they had a little small store and they sold uh, uh, food stuff during the summer and produce, things like that. And then the winter they uh, were coal merchants and they sold coal. People used to heat their houses and sometimes even to cook with. 
And um, the store didn't require uh, uh, his uh, 100% attention. And so he would get out on the streets uh, with a cart and he'd, he'd, he had uh, uh, raised his own horse. And this horse was uh, well-groomed and beautiful. And he had this really neat, sharp, clean cart. And he would get out on the street and uh, he called himself a huckster. And that wasn't meant in a negative term, but he would yell and, you know, I got cantaloupes, I got corn, I got this, I got that. And the, the, uh, the city of Nashville outlawed people from doing that, yelling out in the streets because they said it would take away business from the people who had established stores. And so Keeble couldn't help but sometimes yell, you know, I got this, I got that, uh, you know, get your potatoes here. And so one day a policeman came toward him with the intent of arresting him. And he noticed this beautiful horse and this fine cart and everything was so clean and neat and all that. And the policeman immediately assumed that this belonged, this outfit belonged uh, to some white merchant. And so he got on to Keeble about uh, him, him yelling in the streets and he said, And by the way, whose horse and cart is this? And Marshal Keeble said, It's Mr. Keeble, sir. He said, well, you tell Mr. Keeble that I told you not to be yelling in the street. <clears throat> he said, oh, I will, I will, you know. And so uh, at, the, at, at age of about 19, maybe 20, he realized uh, that he had a gift, and that was a gift for thinking on his feet and being able to immediately come up with a response which would serve him and would make him famous. Because many a time he was challenged uh, uh, as he stood before audiences preaching sound doctrine. And he would always draw crowds both white and black. And people from denominational churches sometimes would challenge him. And if you read books about him, you will see how many wonderful stories there are about how that he, would, he devastated people. Not only with truth, but with timing and with wit and with humor and with love. And so uh, while he was uh, preaching and teaching the gospel of Jesus, he was also whittling away at the racial lines. He had some favorite scriptures. Here's a couple of them. I think his favorite scripture uh, from what I've read was Acts 2.38 and maybe John 3.16. But he used other scriptures such as Acts 17.26. From one man or one blood, he, talking about God, has made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth. And Galatians 3.28. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male or female, for all are one in Christ Jesus. Well, he had heroes, uh, Frederick Douglass and Booker T. Washington. And then his father-in-law became his hero, uh, Brother Womack, who was a gospel preacher. And, uh, and, 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 and Keeble was such an effective evangelist. But uh, like a lot of uh, preachers I've known of, uh, everybody would listen to him but his immediate family. As a matter of fact, his mother uh, would not listen to the gospel and would not respond to the gospel, even though he had become a prominent gospel preacher. But she would listen to him, and, uh, and, uh, and would, she would listen to him without him knowing that she was listening to him. And he was off on a preaching trip one day, and, um, and, and she told some of her family, she said, you tell Marsh when he gets back in town to come see me. And so uh, he got back in town, but just in time, uh, as I read the story, uh, to go to a preaching appointment. And she showed up at the, the, at the tent meeting where he was preaching. And when the invitation was offered, she started down the aisle. And he said, I couldn't wait for her to get there. I ran to her. And they ran and they hugged each other and they cried. And he was able to baptize his, his uh, own mother. Well, um, he... Um, he began preaching while his wife ran the store, and his father-in-law, as I said, was a was a, a gospel preacher. And he was Brother Keeble was hated and loved by both black people and white people. It was not just the whites who sometimes resisted him, but sometimes the whites supported him. But black people also resisted him, not because of his color, but because of his doctrine. Because of the things he was teaching and preaching straight out of the word of God and they would challenge him on it. And some of the, some of the, the more hateful things that were done to him were by black people. But uh, the white people, uh, they mistreated him sometimes uh, as well. Um, A.M. Burton of the National Life and Casualty Company in Nashville, Tennessee took an interest in Marshall Keeble and helped him start three schools 
Two of them, and the, and, the, and the purpose of the school was to educate black people, black young people in particular. And two, the first two failed, but the, Nash, the Nashville Christian Institute survived and lasted for many, many years. And uh, Brother Keeble became a trainer of young black gospel preachers called uh, Keeble's Boys. And he would bring them with him, uh, with him when he uh, would conduct these huge tent meetings. And uh, he would sit out there and they would have singing and praying and, and then uh, he would put these little boys up one by one and they would get up and just confound the audience with their knowledge and their ability to quote entire chapters of scripture and to teach the word of God in his purity and his simplicity. And after those boys had the crowd warmed up, then Brother Keeble would hit the stage. And he was a, even though what Jimmy says he was small in stature, he was a giant, a giant uh, when he got to the pulpit. Well, <clears throat> he was in Summit, Georgia back in 1926. And there was a big uh, uh, tent meeting there. And usually white churches would finance the, the tent uh, and all that. And then the white people would kind of stand around on the periphery. And Jimmy says and at one point where she was, they even had a section roped off for white people. Uh, and the rest of it was open for the black folks. And I've heard stories how that, you know, that white people would come and, 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 uh, and hang around outside the tent and listen. Sometimes sitting in their cars or in their wagons or maybe sitting, you know, or standing around and they'd maybe ridden in on horseback. And so uh, he's in Summit, Georgia, uh, 1926, and 25 uh, members of the Ku Klux Klan showed up in their outfits, you know, with their dunce hats and all that. And, and uh, walked straight in there and walked right up to Brother Keeble. He was preaching and they handed him a note and they said, read this note. And so Brother Keeble took the note and he read it. And it said in so many words, the white man is supreme. And he read it just like that. And then he said this. He said, I've always thought highly of white folks. They brought us out of Africa and lifted us up. And the Klansmen all stood around like, well, you know. And so they, they, they didn't have any more. That's all. They, they had nothing else to say. Uh, later on, I think it was the next day, the, the, the Klan member who handed him that note came to him. And in an apologetic way said, if you have any trouble, you let me know. And I'll take care of it. And so he melted hearts like that. And people ask him later, why would he accommodate these rogues who, you know, interrupted the worship service like that and, 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 and read something that is that despicable. And he said, uh, he, he quoted Matthew five twenty five: agree with your enemy quickly. In other words, don't add, don't pour gas on the fire, you know, uh, just, just, you know, work with it and deal with it and let the Lord uh, deal with it as well. Um, in 1927, he was in Jackson, Tennessee. And a black professor from Lane University challenged him from the audience on Acts 2.38. And he said, what is the Greek on that? And Brother Keeble, again, being a quick thinker, said, let me see the hands of all the people in the audience here tonight who knows Greek. And no one raised their hand. And so he turned to the professor and he said, these people don't know Greek. What good is it going to do them for you and me to discuss Greek? And he just devastated the man with kindness and, again, with brilliance. Um, and that, that was the kind of man he was. Uh, one night he was up preaching and a drunk man uh, came forward during the invitation. But Brother Keeble didn't know he was drunk. And he was wearing a pair of brass knucks. Now, I've, 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 I can just imagine what it would be like to be hit with brass knucks. But this man, had, some of his buddies had dared him to go forward. And when he got up there, he slugged Brother Keeble. And just, of course, just stunned him, knocked him, no doubt, probably knocked him down. And Brother Keeble, you know, shook it off and got back up and just kept on preaching and offering the invitation and encouraging people to come on down the aisle. He never quit. That's the kind of man that he was. Um, he, um, uh, once a man uh, uh, verbally uh, insulted him, he and... Um, Brother Willie Cato. And by the way, I knew Willie Cato. Willie Cato was a white man, and he was Brother Keeble's driver. And Willie Cato died in my presence uh, on the campus of Heritage Christian University. I was presiding over the service that night. And Brother Cato, who was part of the African uh, Christian schools that Brother Keeble helped start, um, got up to encourage people to come to a breakfast the next morning that African Christian schools were going to sponsor. And so this was at the end of the service, and he got up and he talked, and he could he could talk 
uh, and he could sound just like Brother Keeble because he spent so much time with him. And so he made the, the, uh, the exhortation to come to breakfast the next morning and got, came down off the platform and went and sat by his wife on the front pew and just died. Just died right there. Um, but he was a, he was a, uh, Brother Cato was a great man. But anyway, he told about how that they had gone to see someone. I think they were trying to raise some money for the school. And how that uh, this person, whether white or black, I don't know, probably white, insulted Brother Keeble in some kind of derogatory way. And on the way back, Brother Keeble said to Brother Cato, I'm glad that happened. That'll give me one more man to pray for. Isn't that something? Isn't that amazing? That's the kind of character he had. And that's the kind of person that he was. Um, he was always uh, a civil rights leader, but he was a civil rights leader with the gospel. He didn't. He didn't. He wasn't a civil rights leader in the way of getting out and marching, and in streets and things like that. Not saying there's anything wrong with that. I'm just saying that Brother Keeble used the gospel. He especially used Acts 10, chapter 10, and chapter 11 to show how that the Jews didn't want to take the gospel to the Gentiles. They didn't think the Gentiles deserved the gospel. And he would preach and show how that God meant for the whole world to hear the gospel. That the gospel is for all. That the gospel is for everyone. Um, once he was, uh, this was in uh, 1950, he uh, went to the uh, to Abilene Christian uh, it's now Abilene Christian University and it was almost all white crowd and he got up there and he preached Acts chapter 10 and Acts chapter 11 and he said some of you are trying to freeze me out but he said I'm going to defrost you he said I'm going to defrost you with the gospel and with the truth as, as, and, and he went on to say that he was chipping away at the, at the, at the, uh, the you might say the iceberg of racism and um, even the, the leader of that university in that day and time uh, felt that, uh, that the races should be separated even in worship. So Brother Keeble boldly got up there and, 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 and preached the gospel that the gospel is for all. And um, just in the last five or six or seven years, Abilene Christian University has formally apologized for its past uh, racist behavior and attitude. I, I, I submit to you that Marshall Keeble got that done. He got it done with chipping away slowly and gradually starting back in 1950. And again, he did it with the gospel, not by force. Uh, his granddaughter was the first black student ever to live on Pepperdine's campus in uh, Malibu, California. Uh, once in California, a Mormon challenged him, telling Keeble that, uh, uh, that he, uh, the person challenging Keeble, uh, was a member of the Latter-day Saints. And so Brother Keeble knew what a Mormon was, but he wasn't familiar with the term Latter-day Saints. And so he says, you say you're a member of a church called the Latter-day Saints? And uh, the person said, yes. He said, then you're too late. He said, you're too late to be a member of the church you read about in the Bible. Not long after that, uh, someone told him that he was a member of the church uh, that was established before the clouds were flying. And Brother Keeble said, too soon. He said, because when Jesus established his church, the clouds had already been flying. And so he had this way of saying, you know, if some people are in a church that's too late and some people are in a church that's too soon. Um, Brother uh, J.E. Choate. Uh, in 1964, interviewed Brother Keeble, and uh, and uh, that's on tape, and it's still available. I don't have it, but it, but it can be found. And so he said to him, he said, Brother Keeble, you started integrating Lipscomb, talking about Lipscomb University, more than 30 years ago, and they didn't even know what you were doing, did they? And, uh, and, and Keeble went on to say, in response, he said, my preaching made many a white man treat the black man better. In 1963, he raised $50,000 for Oklahoma uh, Christian, what's now known as Christian University, um, and um, in Edmond, Oklahoma, a school I've been to a number of times visiting. And, uh, and, and he gave them the, um, the money, and he said, guess what? They decided to enroll black boys and girls too. He said, I guess they wouldn't take a black man's money uh, without receiving the black students as well. And so he broke down that racial barrier as well. He was a, an amazing man. Here are some of my favorite stories. Um, um, I, uh, I, the, the, have you ever heard the quote, uh, sitting in 
a church house won't make you a Christian any more than sitting in a chicken house will make you a chicken? Well, that came from Marshall Keeble. Uh, you've heard me tell the story that Willie Cato told me once. He said that, that he and Brother Keeble had been off somewhere and Brother Keeble preaching and they were coming back. And uh, Brother Cato was a, a younger man, uh, younger than Keeble. Uh, by the way, Jimmy, I've calculated that he was 72 when you heard him preach that time in, in 1950. Well, um, so the radio was on in the car, and there's some kind of a racy type song. Maybe the lyrics weren't very wholesome. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and the Brother Keeble said, a young man like you ought not be listening to a song like that. And Brother Cato said, yeah, yeah. And then Brother Keeble reached over and just turned it off. He says, matter of fact, an old man like me ought not be listening to a song like that. And so um, he, was, he was that way. Here's, a, here's one of my favorite stories. He was preaching once on uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. And I think I have this on one of those old 33 and a third uh, long playing albums, one of his sermons. Uh, but he's talking about how that uh, when a person uh, is, becomes a Christian, that person dies to the old self and is born again and is born anew and, and becomes new in every way. And he told about uh, how that he was... Uh, preaching in a, in a meeting in a tent and how that uh, uh, a young man uh, kind of hung out on the outskirts uh, the first night. Next night he came in, sat on the back row. Next night he came up, sat about midway. Next night he was up front. And by the end of the week he had become a Christian and was baptized for remission of sin. And then he goes to his father-in-law's house. And it's, uh, it's, it's past bedtime. And he knocks on the door. And the porch light comes on and the, and the father-in-law opens the door a little bit and says, what you want? He said, I've come to get my wife. He said, you can't have her. His daughter he was talking about. He said, because you get drunk and you beat on her and you're not going to do it anymore. You can't have her. And he said, he said, I know that there was a man who would get drunk and beat on your daughter. But he said, that man is dead. He said, I have obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I've been born again, and the man standing before you today would never hurt your daughter. Won't you please tell her that I love her and I want her to come home? And so Brother Keeble would tell that story and, and would break people's hearts with the power of the gospel. Well, um, I, uh, I have a book. Uh, that was written by G.C. Now, he didn't write it. He, he, G.C. Goodpasture, who at that time was the head of the Gospel Advocate, uh, took a stenographer with him to Atlanta once, where Brother Keeble was preaching in a big tent meeting there in 1931. And uh, this court stenographer uh, took down five of Brother Keeble's sermons. And they're, they're mentioned in this book here. As a matter of fact, I was going to cover one of them tonight, but I see the clock's not, not going to let me do it. Um, but um, it, it was called um, The Power of the Written Word. Let me just give you the outline to The Power of the Written Word. First of all, Brother Keeble had this saying, The Bible is right. And he would use John 20, 30 and 31, talking about the power of the written word. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life through his name. And then he would say, now I would like to draw your attention to some things material in order to help you understand some things spiritual. And here were his points. He had a four-point sermon. When buying property, get a written deed. And of course, his point was that the gospel is our contract. Number two, get a receipt when the debt is paid. Told about how that he came in from a preaching trip. By the way, uh, his first wife lived 30 years. And uh, they had five children. Three of them died in infancy. And the other two died before they reached adulthood. And then he, after his first wife passed away, he later on remarried. And his second wife lived until just not long ago, like two or three years ago. She lived to be 108 years old. She lived in Nashville. Uh, and they had children as well. Uh, but uh, he told about coming home with his, his, to his first wife, Minnie. And, um, of course, sometimes he was paid, uh, people would give him chickens for preaching or rabbits or pigs and things like that. And sometimes money. And he had a little money. And so he told Minnie about the money. And she said, let's go down to the store and make our last payment on the furniture. And, uh, but he said, he said, back in those days, black folks had to buy things on installments. Well, I got news for him. White folks did too, if they came from backgrounds like mine. Um, but anyway, they go down to the store 
And they're so happy. They had to take public transportation to get there, a bus or whatever. And they walk in there and they go up to the clerk and, the, and Minnie puts down her money. And she says, and that's the last payment. And the bookkeeper, who was not trying to, um, uh, to, to uh, uh, you know, defraud them in any way, said, no, Minnie, you got one more. She said, no, sir, I don't. He said, yeah, you do. He says, uh, right here it shows you got one more payment. And she says, no, I don't. He says, do you have a receipt? She, and then panic hits her, you know. And she says, we'll be right back. They get back on that bus. They travel back out to their house. And Keeble tells his story. In this book, he said, that woman went all through the house. He said she was reaching in, she was opening sacks and drawers and going through, st- and she found that receipt that showed that she didn't owe any more money. And so, uh, and, and so he said, well, we'll go tomorrow. And she said, no, let's go today. And so they got back on that bus and made the trip back down to town and walked in there and she put down that receipt. And the man said, well, he said, we've made an honest mistake, and you don't, you don't, we see you don't know anything else. If you ever need anything from us, please let us know. So he talked about how that you need a receipt. And, of course, our receipt is that our names are written in the book of life. That's what at Luke chapter 10, verse 20, Brother Keeble was preaching. And then your deed needs to be recorded. And he talks about how that we are recorded in heaven. Um, he, he talked about a, a guy who uh, he knew, a man by the name of John who bought some property from his friend. And uh, the friend said, Now, John, you won't need a deed because I'll take care of you and I'll do the right thing. Well, both of them didn't think about the man who was selling the property dying. Well, he died, and guess what? The man who had bought the property and paid for it had no deed, no deed recorded at the courthouse, and he lost the property as a result of that. He told other stories, Keeble did, about uh, this little poor black family, and they had a life insurance policy, and they, they, they uh, paid 25 cents a month on it, uh, a debit route. And one day, the, uh, the mother uh, was away from home, and she'd left uh, the, the quarter with her little child. And the, the, the man came to collect the money, and, um, and the child gave him the quarter, and he didn't give her a receipt. And the child didn't think about asking for a receipt. And then the next month came around, and of course, by this time, they were in arrears, and they were in trouble simply because for the lack of a receipt. So he talked about how that we need to record our deeds. And then he talks about getting the right name on the document. And he tells a story about a preacher, a denominational preacher who came to a town, uh, a certain town, and was preaching that names don't matter. That there's nothing in a name. It doesn't matter what name uh, you wear and what name is on the building where you worship. And it doesn't matter. And this one lady, a black lady, she kept telling him, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's just not right. And, And you don't need to be preaching that. And so uh, he finishes his evangelistic campaign still preaching that names don't matter. So she told him on the last night, she said, come around to my house tomorrow. And she said, I'm going to give you a, a little money to help you with your work. And so, oh boy, he got up early the next morning. He got all shined up and he goes to her house and he knocks on the door. And she just kind of opens the screen door and hands him a check. He doesn't even look at it. He heads straight to the bank. He slides it into the teller's window and the teller looked at it and slid it back. And he said, what's wrong? He said, not sign, no name on it. And so he goes back to the lady's house. He said, there's no name on this check. She said, I know, because you believe that names don't matter. <laughs> and uh, he said, would you please? And she said, well, all right. But she said, don't you preach that no more. <laughs> you know. So she signed the check. And then all of a sudden, it was good, and it would work. Um, and, so, uh, th- these were, and so he would close the sermon by saying, have you obeyed the written word of God? Let me let, me let you hear a little bit of Keeble. And this, uh, he would be uh, in his, um, oh, he would be in his uh, late 80s because he's talking about uh, going to, ha- having been to Africa. And, um, and he went to Africa. He became a, a world traveler in his 80s. He uh, established schools in Africa. He went to, uh, to Palestine. He went all over. He, he actually went with some other brothers all around the world once. Uh, I don't know, Scott, what I need to do. Maybe I need to hit this arrow. Let's see if this works. Uh, 
I have practiced this, folks, and practiced it. I, it worked 100% every time. I just wanted you to hear a little bit of his uh, voice uh, and how bold he was, even though he was a, a small man. We ask for your patience just for a couple more minutes, and we'll see if we can make this work. sunlight age that we're now in. Thank you. And it pays you and it pays me to look for that light. In our libraries of today, there are many books, but there's only one book that lead us from this earth to a home that's better than this. That book is labeled Holy Bible. If you go in the library, the librarians will tell you that that book is read more than any other book in the library. That's been said by those in a position to know. In a position to know something about the Bible that's attractive. And though men don't want to believe it, they love to read it. There's something about it that's attractive. Okay, thank you, Alan. Um, next slide, please. You'll see the, um, the plan of salvation that we offer every time we stand in the pulpit, either Eric or me or anyone else uh, that preaches uh, from this pulpit. But we want to encourage you to, if Brother Keeble were here tonight, he would boldly encourage you to come forward and to take the hand of the Lord and to allow him to forgive you of your, uh, your sins as a believer who's willing to repent and confess faith in Jesus and receive baptism for forgiveness of sin. Tonight, if that's your need, we encourage you to come. If you're a Christian, but you need the prayers of the church for issues and trouble or burdens in your life, then we encourage you to come as well. If you need to come, come now while together we stand and sing.